Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted today to have with me James Bevan and James Eyre of CCLA, two of the smartest ESG investors in the country with around £10 billion under management. Welcome, guys. Great to be with you. Good morning. Now, ESG is definitely growing in importance. Could you just quickly take us through what the sort of the key drivers are, the, the sort of the growth rates and the size of the industry? Well, kicking off with scale, it's simply enormous. Over $40 trillion is now managed according to ESG principles. That's doubled in four years. That's tripled in eight years. And the drivers behind this are the very clear recognition that extra financial risks are now really important, not just to saving the planet, trying to drive a superior social outcome, and of course, requiring good governance, and therefore necessarily supporting society, but also the clear and certain expectation this is about better financial returns. And, and how do you actually go about selecting companies and corporates? Because, I mean, obviously, capitalism with a conscience is, uh, is quite a difficult balance, um, and it depends on how much you sort of positively and negatively screen. I mean, a clear sort of like, you know, uh, companies working in armaments and have poor sort of like uh, human rights records will be screened out quite quickly. But I'm looking at some of your portfolio. I mean, you've got Unilever, you've got Amazon, and you've got sort of Roche, and they're, they're, they're squeaky clean in a number of areas, but sort of less so. How do you actually balance that sort of like the pros and cons of a particular company? Well, Paul, perhaps I can deal with the big picture and then get James Ayer to talk about some of the detail. In terms of the big picture, we draw a very significant distinction between ethics, which are about the investors' values, what they care about, and value, which is about trying to maximise long-term returns. And we think that the environment, social norms and governance are really about optimising long-term investor returns. So we don't see any conflict between high ESG standards and excellent financial returns. Now, how this gets done is, of course, an issue of detail. And here's where I need James to talk about some stock examples. Sure. So, you know, one of, one of the kind of key issues is that we recognize there's a lot of um, extra um, data available to fund managers now to look into and more closely analyze these companies. But, but we can't just rely on data purely to do, um, to do all of the work. So ultimately, it comes down to detailed due diligence. You mentioned a few of the companies in our portfolio, and maybe perhaps we can address some of those issues. I mean, first of all, the, the perfect company on an ESG set of metrics just simply doesn't exist. So you're quite right. There's, there's a balancing act to, to, to be had. And so uh, there's also you know, an understanding of the, the relative merits of a company in its sector, and in the global invest investable universe. So if we take Unilever, Unilever recognizes as a company that the world is changing fast and that it needs to change with it. So it started relatively early back in, um, in 2010 with a sustainable living plan, which really is designed to accelerate the company's growth, push it towards the correct um, set of agendas, which ultimately its consumers are demanding. So more natural products would be one good example. And then try and decouple that growth from, from the sort of heavier environmental impacts than simply pursuing um, a cause such as, um, you know, untraceable palm oil, for example, um, if views are sort of non-sustainable. So it spent a lot of time in its supply chain trying to understand where it sources its palm oil from and what um, environmental impact that is having on the planet. How do you so score that, it, James? How do you actually score that? I mean, is, do, you have, do you have sort of like a... a a rating of 100. I mean, how, how, when you do your due diligence, how do you sort of balance the pros and cons up to get is sure. it like a R of 50 or something? Or so, so it's not a scoring process per se. I mean, in governance, we can, we can score companies reasonably easily. And we have a set of metrics and factors, and we've built our own uh, internal governance score to do just that. But in these, in these uh, softer issues, it, it's more difficult and more nuanced. Um, and so what you can do is you, you can use third party data, but you also have to supplement that with engagement with the company and properly understanding some of the softer issues, too. So, I mean, you can you can certainly use that data to, to score on, on the ESG metrics, but that's not a substitute for, for properly understanding whether these companies are on top on top of their game. And Unilever certainly does stand out as a company that is, is leading in, in its field. So it's, it's not as simple as just straightforward scoring in, in, in all instances. 
Okay, and just going back to the sort of the, the returns, uh, James B. This one before. Um, what sort of like returns are you looking for with sort of like ESG investing? Would it be? I mean, it, there used to be always a criticism of environmental or, or ethical or, or responsible investing that it re- would deliver lower returns. But but frankly, in the pandemic, it's it's, it's outperformed the rest of the market and. Uh, what sort of returns would you expect going forward from sort of like uh, responsible or, or in ethical investing? Well, let me stick my neck out and say absolutely that we expect premium returns from high ESG standards because ESG is about correctly understanding the extra financial risks. And we worry about therefore a combination of legislation, regulation, litigation, and customer action saying, look, guys, this is bad. We don't want to be part of this. And that, I think, undermines the case of profitability for many companies. And if they don't fully understand and then manage those risks, there is a real challenge to shareholder value. So I do believe that ESG is primarily about reducing the risks of exposure to companies that have blow ups simply because they are badly run and badly organized. And what about the oil and gas sector? I mean, that used to be such a large weighting of the FTSE and sort of a driver for dividends for income investors. And, and now you get a large swathe of the investing community basically saying it's uninvestable because of, the, of its carbon footprint. Yes, Paul, there are some very interesting challenges here, one of which relates to the whole challenge of Uh, so-called stranded assets. And stranded assets refers to the challenge that many companies are valued on the basis of their hydrocarbon reserves. But if we burnt all of the carbon reserves, the climate change that we would then experience would uh, shut down the planet. And therefore, there is a a very clear expectation that legislation and regulation will deny that happening. So we cannot reasonably value oil and gas companies based on their reserves. We have to instead think about the interaction of their financial returns with their capacity to operate on an ongoing basis, particularly as sustainable energy is now receiving so much more investment and is price competitive. And I equally do believe that people who look at the oil and gas sector as just large in capitalization terms ignore the reality that active value really should be adding value for investors. It's about making sure that you are focused on the future and not the past. And of course, oil and gas are huge in the index because they are yesterday's industry and have continued to operate in that space. And when you're also like you're balancing your view returns with your ESG investing, let's just hypothetically say one of your investments does really, really, really well and zooms up, not, no pun intended, to a sort of like astronomical evaluation, maybe an Amazon or a Beyond Meat or something which has got a lot of momentum. Would you ever sell an ESG compliant investment beyond valuation terms? Do you want me to answer that one, Absolutely, we would, Paul. Our task primarily is to deliver fantastic long-term investment returns of which ESG is part. And perhaps I can hand over to James now to talk a little bit about some of the recent trends that we have done, recognizing that price and value have to stay connected. Sure thing. So, I mean, to that point, you know, would we have a a sell? As James says, yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, we're we're disciplined investors and we want to make investments on a genuinely long-term view. But as uh, investments uh, move to, to astronomical levels, we, we typically are trimming them. And, uh, you know, so we've seen this run up in the market uh, post the, the, the low in, in March. Uh, we've absolutely taken action. So in, in August, we were trimming a number of our IT positions, really on the basis that um, we felt that they got a, a bit ahead of themselves. And we do think that the potential on, on a long term view is still there. But names like PayPal, and as you mentioned, Amazon and Microsoft had, had all started to move into territory which we felt um, warranted uh, trims. And we also invested uh, and continue to invest in a small way in a company called Diasorin, which is a testing uh, business. Uh, and, and again, that, that obviously benefited very substantially from a re-rating linked to the outbreak of COVID. But clearly the market sort of extrapolates out growth ad infinitum. 
and and we're in the process of uh, uh, you know a pandemic which ultimately will peter out. So it's unrealistic to to extrapolate growth forever. So on that basis, you know, we've severely sort of trimmed trimmed that position back too. Um, so you know, cri- price and and discipline on valuation is really important uh, within the investment process. So, so here's a here's another tricky question, maybe. <laughs> if you've actually been trimming some of your winners. And therefore, by definition, presumably the population of investable ideas is less in terms of because a lot of them have been very done, been very successful. Where are you actually putting your money, or are you just parking it currently a bit more in cash to give you some firepower when there is a sort of like a, a better wobble as there was were that was sort of last week with an eight percent correction on Nasdaq? James or. At, Mr. A, you, you talk about some of the names that we've been cycling into because sure. this is about wanting to continue to identify great investment opportunities, but in global equities remaining invested. So, I mean, it, obviously in the market sell-off in, in March and April, we, we added uh, an initiated number of positions there. So we maintain a watch list of stocks um, and, and we often find companies that we really like, but, but not always at the right valuation. So we try and be very patient um, and very focused on what we think the right right entry point would be for them. Uh, so we, we picked up a small number of stocks um, back at that point. So uh, Hermes, the luxury goods company, we purchased um, a, a starting position in that. Uh, Ansys, uh, which is a, a, a particularly uh, specialist uh, business. It's an industrial business, but it specializes in physics engines for the testing of um, engineering models uh, and CAD design. Uh, that was another business we picked up. Now, obviously, as we've seen the market uh, premium expand, uh, and as we've got into sort of August, we've still been able to find some good ideas. Uh, one, of, one of the names that we added to quite significantly um, in, in uh, kind of early August was TSMC, so Taiwan Semiconductor, which is uh, one of the largest foundries. So there's been a trend. Very over- well recently, haven't they? I think didn't they sort of like put out some excellent results, largely supply in the cloud and effect on the electronics boom from, from work at home. Yes, I mean the, you, you're quite right. I mean there was a couple of things that, that played into their favour. I mean we 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 looked at the stock quite three or fifteen times P, it's not around twenty two times, and really identified it as a valuation anomaly. Um, we, we've we've owned the company for for many years. We regard it as one of the sort of best in class uh, semi names. Um, and, and so we added to it on the on the basis of valuation, and then we we had the sort of double benefit. It had a strong set of results, and then one of its competitors, Intel, um, had a, had a number of issues with their seven nanometer technology, which obviously saw the stock price uh, move move far higher as a result of that. So, I mean, a happy coincidence uh, rather than the deep insight in, in, on our part in terms of the forward looking potential of these things happening, but really a, a judgment call based on valuation. Okay, and then just take it a step back on the macro side. What is your, your top level view in terms of sort of where the market's heading? I mean, we've got a sort of like a big contrast between growth and value. I think growth has outperformed value by 30, 35% this year. I mean, just look at the FTSE compared to sort of the NASDAQ. And, and again, just recently, we've had sort of like an increase in infection rates and worries around Brexit, and which has sort of dampened some of the mid cap and small cap sectors in the UK. What's your sort of the view in terms of go forward top level? Well, to kick off with, the macroeconomic backdrop we think is going to be uh, identified by a long period of relatively slow real growth and also quite low inflation for the next couple of years. Uh, this in part relates to the inventory overhang that continues to devil uh, the global economy. But also, it's very interesting seeing how different economies have been responding to the COVID-19 crisis. So, for example, China has been held up as an economy that has been recovering quite quickly. But a lot of China's recovery has been in producing more, in exporting more, and subsidizing those exports in order to be able to build market share. That's really bad news for economies uh, that are developed because they're now having to compete aggressively. It does mean this inflation is being held down. So for the next six months or so, we do believe that the principal driver of markets will continue to be central bank and government spending and liquidity. Very hard to see markets having a material turndown until that liquidity dries up. Now that leads us obviously to the question of where is value? 
And we would argue that the equity risk premium, so the forward excess return from investing in equities relative to bonds, remains very high. We think central banks will hold bond yields down. The bond yields are now representing legal theft. Investors in bonds need to recognize <laughs> that government debt is being held down by a central bank. And if you or I were to try this at home, we would get sent to jail for market manipulation. So I guess your portfolio hasn't got that many um, sort of fixed income and bonds in it. <laughs> Absolutely right. It's just a, a graveyard for people who want to grow the long-term real value of their assets. In contrast, we can see many companies that are high quality, that have high free cash flow, that are sustainable, offering excellent long-term forward returns. As for the risks, uh, I certainly believe that the US presidential election in November is a key factor. Were the Democrats to sweep the presidency plus the two houses uh, of Congress, then we would suspect that Mr. Biden's policies would be brought in. We might see $10 taken off uh, index earnings for the S&P 500. We're projecting $150 for the end of 2021. A $10 reduction in earnings would be quite a swipe in the marketplace. Yeah. The other global risk, of course, is what happens between the US and China. Now, at the moment, as we know, most of the rhetoric and action has been on trade. But trade actually is bad for the US consumer because the goods arrive at the US, tariff is then imposed, and all that happens is the US household has to pay more money. So there is a real risk that this now shifts to a war of capital accounts. Can the US stop China having access to the US dollar, and in particular, access to the US dollar debt markets? Now, if this were to happen, we think that the global economy would suffer significantly, and quite rightly, global markets would fall back. So that's a risk we monitor. As for Brexit, we do worry that the domestic economy is going to be mired with difficulties for the foreseeable future. The good news, if there is any on this front, is that the Bank of England is likely to keep the official rate at 10 basis points for all of this year and all of next year. And in November, we'll likely have to come forward with additional quantitative easing. I, I, I would agree. I mean, I think fundamentally and economically, there's definitely some dark clouds on the horizon in terms of we're all drowning, the governments are drowning under debt and the unemployment is high. I guess the sort of the curveball that is so difficult for the likes of you and myself in terms of investing your own money is if you know there's a medical solution. And I did see yesterday we had Sir Martin Sorrell, who was you know the, the advertising guy. I think he was quoted as he was predicting a full throated recovery in 2021, predicated on there being an availability of a vaccine. Now is there, a, is there a possible scenario, upside risk here, whereby the central banks bridge us over this dark period, over the valley of COVID, and then we see a major recovery next year? So if you sort of take a defensive stature, which clearly CCLA you know, may or may not be doing, but uh, if you take a two defensive stature, then you miss up on the bounce because investors will price that potential medical recovery, which could come through any day. Um, you know, sort of like into the price before you get a chance to buy back in. It's a sort of difficult, really difficult balance and equation to uh, to solve. I, I absolutely accept that that is a risk. But frankly, we think that an awful lot of good news is already baked in prices. Yeah. And when one thinks about some of the big picture challenges, they don't get changed if there is a vaccine. So, for example, we have deteriorating demographics. We have an aging population really difficult to get economic growth. The number of people who are working is declining, and we are in an economy with relatively low productivity trends. The second challenge, of course, is this high level of indebtedness. That's going to take years to work off. The last time that we had low bond yields and rising inflation uh, with official sanction was in the United States between 1942 and 1951. And then bond yields were kept to a ceiling rate of 2.5%. Inflation was allowed to run, and hey, presto, government debt halved over that period. Now, that was a terrible period for bonds, terrible period for gold, interestingly, quite a good period for genuine growth companies. And that leads on to the next issue of, so all this cheap money, what's it done? Well, frankly, it's kept an awful lot of businesses going that should otherwise, in the capital market system, have failed. And that means residual profitability for those who are operating is impaired. Far too many people producing far too many goods that people, frankly, don't want to buy. Uh, 
And against that backdrop, I'm absolutely confident that you have to stick to quality in this environment. And I'm driving quality as companies that have some control over their pricing and some control over their costs as evidenced by a persistent return on capital employed. So you could get a, you could get a scenario on the inflation side where you have CPI being sort of held down by technology and excess capacity, as you talk about. But equally, you could see asset price inflation if governments run their economies hot to remove their um, their, their, their their debt levels, which could see sort of the likes of housing and stocks, um, you know, equities go, you know, do very well. So you could have a huge divergence here. You could get an asset price boom, but effectively at the CPI level and, you know, salaries and people like So you have a real decrease in people's own sort of like income stream. But a, a, for people with assets and hard assets could actually go through very well. Is that is, is that sort of like a, a potential scenario? That is absolutely a potential scenario. And I think that the flip side that we have to focus on as well is what happens to the labor share of revenue. Really since the end of the 1970s, shareholders had it good at the expense of workers. So the proportion of revenues has flowed through to profits that have supported share progress has been very profound and has often been accompanied by a markdown in inflation. I would suggest that the rise of popularity of Mr. Biden in the States is emblematic with the expectation that the workers now think that somehow it's just not right, it's not fair, and that if we see the labor share of GDP begin to rise again, then I do think that profits are going to fall back. And then again, we absolutely have to be focused on quality. Otherwise, again, we're faced with a negative cycle of falling profitability and falling valuations. And into that sort of environment with a number of sort of moving, moving balls and moving targets, what are you looking at as a potential sort of like investments going forward? What's on your stock watch list in terms of, you know, redeploying some of the cash? James, why don't you talk about some of our current ideas? Sure. I mean, in, ter in terms of, you know, equity space, I mean, we we've retained, um, you know, relatively um, uh, high equity allocation, really on the basis that James has just been talking about and a focus on quality growth. I mean, names that for us continue to stand out as, as very attractive in this environment are, are, are stocks like Agilent. So Agilent works uh, within the life science industry. Uh, life science is quite a small industry. Um, it's quite oligopolistic in terms of the number of providers into it. So there's a few competitors. Um, and Agilent focuses uh, on uh, bioanalytics um, and electronic measurement, predominantly where it's typically a number one player. Uh, it's a razor razor blade model. It's the sort of business that we really like. So it's got um, you know effectively revenues that repeat through time. Uh, it doesn't have to go out and make new sales all the time. So it, it puts an instrument or a series of instruments in the laboratory. And then it gets a revenue stream from maintaining those instruments, servicing them and providing the consumables. Um, and for us, that, that business is extremely well placed um, on, on a long term view, really as uh, the burden of regulation, particularly in things like food and pharmaceuticals, where people demand to know, um, you know the quality uh, of, of the substances. Uh, that they're injecting into themselves or, or putting in their mouths ultimately become more and more important. Um, and so that company is benefiting from a number of long-term secular trends um, and is a company that also you know, maintains very high margins and very attractive and growing returns on invested capital. And would, so it, also, would, it, would it also benefit if the, if the world have to make sort of billions and billions of doses of vaccine? It, it, it does play into the pharmaceutical um, kind of supply chain. So, yes, it, it, is, a, it is a beneficiary um, of, of sorts, but it, it's not a major beneficiary per se. Um, th this really is, is, is around broad testing, and it, it has many um, industries and verticals that it's exposed to, not, not just pharmaceuticals. So anything that you can think of that needs to be tested in a laboratory, you know, these, the, these guys have involvement in that. So, so, so that's one, one example. I mean, another which we think, on a sort of similar vein, but, but still very well placed longer term, we talked about um, the importance of food safety, nutrition, uh, a stock that we have been following and looking at closely um, and, and now only in the portfolios is Kerry Group. It's an Irish domicile business, but it's a global business um, and it's a specialist ingredient and flavor technology company. And it's an area of the market we really like. We like it because while some of the, uh, the food groups have struggled to grow, 
the complexity of, of creating recipes, foods and flavours, particularly natural elements to yeah. that. Clean labels. Clean label, exactly. There can be sustainably sources growing much faster. And Kerry is a big beneficiary of that through time. So those are a couple of examples to give you a kind of flavour of what we've been looking at. And top level, are you playing sort of offence or defence or a bit of a mixture? <laughs> Your offence on things you really like, but sort of like defence on a lot of other stuff. We, we've been looking to, to place the portfolio in companies that ultimately are masters of their own destiny, that are, you know, in our eyes, some of the great, great companies of the world, and that ultimately are, are not hugely sort of operationally levered. So uh, typically they're benefiting from secular rather than cyclical growth, and where we can see those, those growth drivers being maintained um, you know, for, for a reasonable amount of time into the future. And for those companies, typically they're, they're capital light, um, so that means higher returns on invested capital. So they're cash, very cash generative, and that cash can be returned to our shareholders or reinvested for future growth in the business. And we think that's really fundamentally important in a world that's mired in debt. Companies that have clean balance sheets are very cash generative and are really in control of their destiny. Really, really matters in this environment. So it's um, and it's a quality, essentially. Quality, yeah, exactly. So, you know, strong cash conversion is one of the hallmarks of that. And I think just to one other point that you make, which is, you know, are we defensive or offensive? Well, we're, we're, we think we're both. So, I mean, by focusing on quality, that, that has elements of defensiveness, mm -hmm. but also looking for businesses that can grow on secular drivers, you know, that's offense, essentially offensive. So, effectively, they're going to be beneficiaries and they're not highly dependent on cyclical expansion in the economy. And then do you use any, on the defence side, do you use any protection in terms of derivatives or you, you buy futures or anything like that? Or do you just really play the long game and therefore that gives you the natural hedge that you, if we do go through another correction because you've bought quality, it will recover over the sort of the, the, the short to medium term? We're looking to play the long game and underpin all of our endeavours in terms of the free cash flow that we get back from our companies. So to, to, to your question on derivatives, no, we, we, we don't dabble in derivatives or, or complex options. Uh, we, from time to time, um, do currency hedging, um, really though on the underlying assets that we, we own, and, 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 and that um, you know, relatively seldom, it very much depends on, on the currency markets and, and the currency pairs. But no, un underlying and underpinning the portfolio, it's, just, it's a clear focus on free cash flow and free cash flow growth. And then what sort of like um, data would you sort of monitor or look at to give you an early read of the sort of the economy and where the market's going? Would you look at the sort of like, I don't know, triple B corporate bank debt to see whether that, you know, whether that was moving between investment grade or junk or, you know, the yields on it? Or would you look at sort of... Uh, I'm not, you know, alternative data sources or even bank shares or anything like that. Is there anything of, of note you look at that gives you an early read or might give investors an early read um, of where the direction of the market's going? We are absolutely at the economic data that is published, most of which is trailing, but it's important that we keep an eye on it. It's obviously it forms the base plate for the next set of releases. Uh, we certainly look at market indicators, including credit spreads, uh, and also at lead indicators from entities such as the Institute of Supply Management and the Purchasing Managers. And we believe that uh, we are able not only, therefore, to have a perspective of where the market is going in terms of economic fundamentals, but also the probable behavior of investors. And one of the areas that I suspect is most neglected in our industry is thinking about how investors actually behave in different conditions. And as James has identified, we want to buy great companies, but we want to pay the right price. And therefore, we spend a lot of time trimming in and trimming out according to variations in price relative to valuations. Okay. Um, what would be the sort of the maximum level you'd have for a stock position? Would that be sort of 5%? Would, you know, is, is that sort of like the, the, the greatest, sort of like the, the, the largest size before you start trimming? In terms of equity, we run a, a very diversified book. So we typically have between 80 to 100 securities in our global um, portfolios. And, and the maximum position size is, is normally not greater than 3.5%, but, but that typically below that level. Okay. And then if it, just finally, if it, sort of any ingenious investors want to do their own sort of ESG sort of set fund, how would you sort of like practically be able to do this? Or is it really, is it best just to go for a, a fund that specializes in it? Or, 
is there any simple things? Because, I mean, we had Boo Who, unfortunately, having allegation was in the media recently. It just shows you how difficult this is to get right. We had a lot of sort of even professionals who had to exit their positions. So how would be sort of like the best sort of, you know, sort of tip or just general advice you would give to ingenious investors who want to try ESG investing on themselves? You know, it's amazing what's available on the internet just by using search engines. If you were to look up a company and then type in ESG, the number of chat rooms and data sources and reports that have been filed on companies and what they're doing is huge. And uh, Boohoo's uh, challenges were well recognized by those of us who took ESG seriously. And uh, frankly, I think that it was a disgrace that people held Boohoo. Mm -hmm. They also said that ESG mattered to them. As for funds, I would encourage investors not so much to look at the current holdings that could only be a snapshot through time, but look about how managers make decisions and whether or not the investor can really trust what the manager is saying and whether it is backed up by fact. Okay, guys, that's absolutely um, that's absolutely brilliant, and many thanks for your time. Um, just finally, and. If an investor wants to put um, any um, any money into sort of like um, CCLA, where would be the best place to contact um, the, the business? Just through the website? Or? We, we run money for churches, charities, and local authorities. And indeed, we have a website, which is www.ccla.co.uk. Brilliant, guys. Well, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you. <laughs>